Good afternoon. And for those of you who are joining us, we are allowing our participants into the room at the at this moment. You are muted and we do ask that you remain muted. If you have questions for our speaker today or for our moderators, we ask that you please use the chat function on Zoom and we will um, read your questions and have an opportunity at the end of the presentation to ask questions. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Hello. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. We're gonna get started in about one minute. We are still allowing uh, folks to join the conversation today. You are all muted and we ask that you please stay muted throughout our program uh, this afternoon. If you do have questions, which I'm sure you do, please use the chat function to type in your question and we will make sure we get to them uh, and ask them during the presentation or at the end. We do have time at the end of the talk today to allow for question and answers. Lastly, I wanna let you know that this is being recorded and we will make the recording available after the conversation. Again, thanks so much for joining us and we'll get started shortly.
I can't hear you. I haven't talked yet, but here I am. Um, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. I am March 11. I am the Assistant Regional Director here at ADL, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. I just want to give a few housekeeping notes. If you wouldn't um, mind, please stay muted so that we can hear everybody, hear our presenters talk. There will be time at the end to ask questions, but if you do have a question, please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to ask any question that you may have um, so that we can continue moving forward. We have a lot to cover today. And uh, if you write your chat, your question in the chat, we will get to it um, during the presentation. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to uh, ADL Southwest Regional Director, Mark Tobin. Uh, thank you, Margie, and good afternoon to everyone, and thank you all for joining. Uh, it's, it's great to be here and great to see everyone. Uh, we are two weeks away from the November 3rd election, uh, which, uh, as you all know, uh, is, a, is a critical uh, juncture in our country. Uh, we've invited y'all here to really take a look behind the scenes at understanding the voting process in, in Harris County in Texas uh, with one of the country's foremost experts who happens to be close by at Rice University, uh, Dr. Robert Stein. Um, before we uh, bring on Dr. Stein, first I want to welcome um, our co-host, uh, co-moderator, as, as well as our co-host, uh, Rabbi David Siegel, uh, who is with the Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism, Texas, uh, or for short, RAC Texas. Uh, David, uh, first of all, thank you all for being our co-host and co-moderating. How are you? Good. Um, I'm excited to be in this partnership and glad we are finally officially doing something together. It's been an unofficial partnership for a long time, so happy to have this program on the calendar and, and more to come. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. We also are looking forward to it. Um, also, before we get to the program, I would like to just uh, mention a couple of up upcoming programs uh, for ADL. First of all, tomorrow uh, at noon as well. That's uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, at October, on October 21st. Uh, we have a program uh, on extremism and the election. Uh, this will feature Oren Siegel, who's ADL's vice president of on the Center on Extremism, uh, and it'll cover the subject of how extremism and political violence are manifesting this election cycle and the potential impact they may have on the election outcome and beyond. Um, so if you haven't signed up for that, I urge you to do that. Um, I think there's a registration button uh, or link in the chat or will be in there soon. So you can check for that and I do urge all uh, to sign up if you're interested in that very important topic. And the second uh, is something that's going to be happening after the election. Um, and that is ADL's Never Is Now uh, Summit. Uh, this is the world's largest summit on anti-Semitism and hate. It's usually held uh, in New York City. Uh, but for obvious reasons, it's going to be virtual. Uh, and it's also going to be free this year. Uh, and instead of going over two days, it's going to be held um, over a little over two weeks, November 8th through 19th. Uh, and it's going to be spread out. The summit will kick off at 7 p.m. on November 8th with an opening plenary uh, that will feature a panel reviewing the election, the annual State of Hate Address, and the presentation of ADL's 2020 Courage Against Hate Award. Uh, then breakout sessions will be spread out over the next 11 days on November 10th, 12th, 17th, and 19th from 1 to 2 p.m. Uh, breakout topics uh, will include subjects like anti-Semitism in progressive spaces, how it looks, and black Jewish relations in 2020, navigating a changing world. Uh, the closing plenary will be on November 19th at 7 p.m. and will feature a uh, panel on the importance of athletes as role models in the fight against hate and the successful Stop Hate for Profit campaign, which was launched this year to hold social media companies accountable for hate on their platforms. Uh, to learn more and to register, uh, please visit uh, vents.adl.org slash never is now. Uh, there'll also be a link put in the chat. Um, this year's summit also features a dedicated track for high school students to participate with uh, special sessions and post-event virtual gatherings. 
uh, and that can also be found on our website. So please uh, check out those two uh, very valuable opportunities. Um, uh, Dr. Robert Stein, first of all, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Dr. Stein is uh, the fellow in urban politics at the Baker Institute uh, and the Lena Grohlman Fox Professor of Political Science at Rice University. Uh, he's also the faculty director at Rice Center for Civic Engagement. His current research focus includes alternate modes of elections and voting procedures in the United States. He teaches courses on public policy, urban politics, and political behavior at Rice, where twice he has been awarded the George R. Brown Award for Superior Teaching. Um, he, as well as uh, Rice University, um, are collaborating with the Harris County Clerk's Office, uh, both in 2018 and this year, uh, to help guide them on uh, how to be more effective in uh, handling the election. Um, and I just learned that also he testified in the recent uh, case involving Pennsylvania, on which the Supreme Court just ruled. Uh, Dr. Stein, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, and I understand uh, you have a, a presentation. So if you want to go ahead and launch that. Sure, I didn't know if you, um, sure, let me uh, get a hold of the screen. Let's see, I don't seem to be able to get the screen. Um, only the host, uh, let's see. I can get well, if you, you oh, need, I got it. I got it. got it, all right, there we go. I got um, it. And let me start the slideshow. Can everybody see that? Um, I, David, uh, Rabbi Siegel asked me a couple of questions in an email. And so I thought I'd um, address myself to just three questions. Um, inevitably, people want to know who's going to win the election. And I, I always tell them, I, I, in this election, I'm really very, very certain I've got it down to two people. And I, I don't mean that to be facetious, because in this election season, it's not always obvious who's running for what. Um, but this is the lay of the land as of yesterday. As we all know, it takes 270 electoral votes. Um, and we're down to probably a handful of states um, that um, really are battlegrounds and where there's about 187 electoral votes. Um, the important point here is that um, Vice President Biden has what I would call a comfortable lead, maybe even a, a cautious lead, but it's not by any means um, out of the realm of possibility that President Trump would win this election. I will tell you with certainty, and there's very little in life that is certain, but I'll say this, in absolute certain terms, uh, Joe Biden will win the popular vote. There's no way that President Trump will win the popular vote. In fact, I'll go so far as to say, at a minimum, uh, Biden will win the popular vote by 3 million, and I could easily see that number going in excess of 5 million, particularly in states like New York, and of course, California and our own state of Texas. Uh, what's important here are the battleground states. And why are the battleground states important? I'll talk about this a little bit later, but look at Florida, Georgia, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Those are the ones which I look to for real outcomes. I don't think Ohio, Iowa, North Carolina, I think is safely in the Democratic column. I think that Ohio is a Republican state. However much, if you want, I can talk about Texas at greater length. But I think what you want to look to on uh, election night is Florida. At 8 o'clock, they'll close the polls. And they are a pre-processing state for mail-in voting, which means what? It means they're already counting the mail ballots. So you won't have to wait. But in Michigan, Wisconsin, and in Pennsylvania, law does not allow them to count mail-in ballots. And as we'll talk about in a moment, Mail-in voting is going to probably be critical here, and that's, of course, what the Supreme Court ruled on yesterday um, in Pennsylvania, allowing the state to count mail ballots six days after the election, but the mail ballots obviously have to be received and postmarked or received by election night. Um, what's important here is that um, there's going to be a lot of mail-in balloting, and let's look at the next slide, and I think there's going to be a lot of, we think of early voting in Texas as in-person early voting. But early voting now this year will include mail ballots. Um, and it's estimated that 75% of all voters in this country can vote by mail. Uh, and I would imagine that we will see a three to four fold increase in the share of vote cast by mail, by mail. Then there's always the in-person early voting. 30 million ballots have already 
as of the 19th of October. Um, that's close to 10% of the of, of the total number of votes that we expect to be cast. And that number will continue to get larger and larger um, before election day. So the important point to think about is in these states, which we just talked about previously, um, voters are already voting. They're voting in Florida, Georgia, Iowa, North Carolina, Ohio, Arizona, Texas, Pennsylvania, Nevada. Um, they are voting in all of these states and Wisconsin as we speak. And as that number gets higher, and what obviously is driving that number up, are people concerned about COVID-19. If you want to get a real idea of what's going on, um, this is from the New York Times. It's a weighted average of all the polls. But what I find most interesting is if the polls were wrong as they were in 216, and again, in a question and answer, I don't buy the argument the polls were wrong, you can begin to see where the president and where President, Vice President Biden are leading. And anything much over five points is probably a considerable one. But if you look at states that are in balance, Michigan, Wisconsin, what's really interesting here in Wisconsin is that um, if you look at just the polls in 212, Biden's up by eight, but he's actually down by about one or even if the polls in 216 were operating here. So. There is a lot of margin of error. I'd be happy to talk about polling. My sense is that, um, again, there is a much narrower margin here for the president. In fact, if you want to handicap it, my sense is if you believe that the electoral um, votes in any state where the candidate is leading by three or more, Biden wins. That's probably not likely. If you believe that the electoral polls, the polls translate perfectly, the current polls, Biden wins by what is probably a landslide. The one that's real interesting, if the electoral votes are based on the polls as they were wrong in 216. So let's assume that we're just, we're back in 216 and the president pulls off a narrow victory in the electoral college based on the polling that was done after the election or the exit polls, you can begin to see that Biden holds on to the same 100 electoral votes that I predicted up here. So can the president win? Absolutely. He probably has a 16 to 22% chance of winning this election. And you say, well, that's not very much. People have won World Series and poker bets and many other things, including hurricanes. So by no means is this an election that's over. What is unprecedented is how many votes have already been cast. These are in-person early votes and mail ballots together. I've combined them from my colleague, Michael McDonald at the University of Florida, who monitors this pretty carefully. I should have put his website up if you want to watch it. But very simply, look at the number of Democrats that have already voted by mail or in person compared to Republicans. For me, as an academic at least, and as a practitioner of campaigns, I find this the most baffling finding so far. As a general rule, Republicans are more likely to vote early and by mail than Democrats. That's largely because Republicans tend to be older. And most of the states in previous years that have made mail-in voting available have made it available almost exclusively to people over the age of 65. So it shouldn't be a surprise that mail-in voting was used by people over 65 who also coincidentally, maybe not coincidentally, were slightly more likely to vote Republican. But it's completely flipped. And the question is why, and if I can just offer two explanations, at the next slide, this is a change. We surveyed at, at Rice for the county clerk as part of our research to help him and previously Ms. Troutman where do voters want to vote? By mail, in person early, on election day, so they could set up an appropriate number of locations on and before election day and be prepared for mail ballots. In 216, 75% of the people who voted early, or 73 to be exact, are going to vote early in 2020. This is based on a survey that we finished 12 days ago. You can see a lot of in-person early voters were moving to mail-in voting, and 8% were going to vote on election day. 
And you can begin to see the pattern. People who were voting by mail in 2016, almost 77% are holding up, but about 20% want to vote in person early. Now, let me show you what it looks like in Harris County. We simply asked 4,100, 4,100 voters in Harris County over about a 12 day period, we surveyed them, how you are going to vote if you could vote by mail. We only asked that question of people we knew were eligible to vote by mail by virtue of their age, their disability, or their being out of the jurisdiction. And that was about 2000 of those voters. Gives you an idea of how many are really over 65. But look at the numbers. About 44% said they would not vote by mail. The balance, almost 50%, in fact, 50.1 to be exact, have already applied for a mail ballot or plan to. And this is as of about the third week in September, before early voting. But look at the partisan breakdown. The world couldn't be different. 59% of voters who identified themselves as Republicans and were eligible to vote by mail told us, no, they're not applying. Compared to 64% of Democrats add, yes, I've already applied and yes, I plan to. We've been studying this. We've been interviewing. We've interviewed close to 12,000 voters in Harris County since March and April. And what we've seen since the president's attack on vote by mail is a steady stream of Republicans who had voted by mail moving away from it. The explanation appears to be the president. And the president's attack vote by mail, not here in Texas or in his own home state now of Florida, where he also votes by mail. His attack has been mostly on what we know as vote by mail, where you're automatically mailed the ballot for reasons I have never understood and will never understand until someone explains it to me, the president is convinced that vote by mail is not only fraudulent, but dangerous to Republicans. If you watch CNN or looked at the New York Times today, finally, Republican campaign managers in several states are literally, I guess, pulling their hair out because for many Republicans, voting by mail has not only been the choice, but has been an effective way to mobilize voters. If you wait till election day to vote, there's always a chance you don't vote. If you're a candidate and you're trying to mobilize your voters, your supporters, you want to bring them out early by mail or in person early so that you spend more time on the most recalcitrant or procrastinating of voters. Um, the short answer to the question, why did the president do it? I don't think he knows. I really don't. I think, and I think more than anything else, this could be more harmful to his reelection than any other action he's taken or hasn't taken, because this is what gets your base out. What could happen? Several battleground states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania will have late mail ballot returns. I expect that the, um, if the margin of victory um, on election night is not greater than 5% for Joe Biden or is, this, is a victory for the president, um, I expect the president to declare um, himself the victor in the estates. Those could be states, all three of them, that could get him the electoral victory. And he will move immediately to enjoin and prevent the counting of mail ballots. In, in Pennsylvania, the issue will be over drop boxes. Um, so I think you'll, you'll, you've not yet heard the last of this. And the 4-4 tie was only because Ms. Barrett had yet, not yet to be confirmed. And I believe she will be confirmed and be on the court on election night that might hear this immediate. A high share of new ballot voters means what? All of this early voting produces high rates of disqualified mail ballots. Those of us who study this over the years and have watched states go from mail from in-person to mail-in voting, uh, like riding a bike, you're more likely to fall off if you've, if you've not used the bike before. And there will be a high rate of disqualifications, not because of third party and nefarious efforts, but simply because voters are most likely not to mark their ballots, not to sign them, not to put them in the security envelope, and not to return them on time. Yeah, uh, Dr. Stein, can I ask you, no, well, I don't want to interrupt so much, but I know that's an issue in Pennsylvania in particular with the security envelopes. Uh, how many ballots do you expect will be disqualified in Pennsylvania because of that issue? 
I would imagine, um, I'm going to stop my slide presentation if it's okay and um, get back to and give you back your um, screen. Those of us who study this, and if you're really interested, the MIT and Stanford have a, a collaboration on which I'm a, a part of, and we estimate between eight and 10% of all male ballots will probably be invalidated solely due to voter error, solely due to the errors of voters. Some of which will of course be a function of the state laws regulating things like security envelopes, signatures that have to match signatures in the past. Some of it will be that a ballots can't simply be read because people didn't properly fill in the full bubble and still others um, will not have gotten their ballots back in time to be counted. So anything that, uh, you know, when you go from 8% has been the average share of vote cast in our own state of Texas mm -hmm. by mail-in ballots. I could show you more slides, but remember there are only about six states that have been doing vote by mail where everybody's mailed a ballot who's a registered voter. That's what the president's complained about. But there are states all in the West, Utah, Colorado, Nevada, Oregon and Washington. Now Vermont and California have been added to that list. But 34 states have no excuse mail-in voting. Only Pennsylvania, for instance, um, is the largest of the battleground states that under executive order from their governor, a Democrat, because of COVID-19, ordered that um, anyone could vote by mail. Problem, they just, it takes years to build a good vote by mail system. You don't do it overnight. And I think the biggest concern that uh, my colleagues and I who've worked in this area is that um, it isn't uh, third parties that are standing there trying to prevent ballots from being returned to drop off locations. It is simply voting by mail. It's just not something that many people have done before. Um, and as a consequence are susceptible to making mistakes and you can be certain that in states um, like Pennsylvania, there will be poll watchers who will be attempting. The big issue in Pennsylvania um, was the sleeve, the, the, the second envelope. We have it in Texas. But the other big one was um, dropping off ballots at um, what we call remote locations, <laughs> which I, I apologize for laughing. But when I testified before the judge, he said, Mr. Professor Stein, which, which is the new box and which is the old box? I said, you figure it out. Uh, of course, the box that the Republicans wanted was a post box that had been there for 50 years in front of a Philadelphia library. The new one that cost $5,000 in Chester County, outside of Philly is, um, was like, looked like Fort Knox. Um, and of course, the Republican, the, the Trump party didn't want the, they, they felt okay with the post box. Um, but again, politics is about winning. And um, my, my worry will be um, on election night, if these in-person votes are close, um, these mail ballots may be um, the subject of what happened in Florida in 2000. While we're on the, the mail, <clears throat> mail ballot topic, um, I understand it was just a decision affecting a Texas, some Texas litigation around the mismatch of signatures out of McAllen. I think it was a Jewish woman who was one of the plaintiffs in that. Um, can you, have you, do you know much about this case? Can you comment on the, what, I mean, where there, that stands there, right there now? Been, um, I don't know about that particular case. I know, for instance, a court ruled yesterday that the state cannot mandate county clerks or election officials contact what we call curing the vote. If somebody sends in a ballot and the, and the signature doesn't match, in many jurisdictions, um, voters will be given an opportunity by the clerk to contact them to cure their ballot. Cure it oh, means. she's here, actually. <laughs> Rosalie Weisfeld, plaintiff, is here on, on this chat, at least. In yeah, the and uh, again, uh, although the clerks can do that, um, of course, they're not mandated to. And what's more problematic with that is how do you cure it? I can tell you how states like Colorado have perfected their matching of signatures over the last, I've been working in Colorado since 2006. And, in, and it's, in, you know, like I've said before, you don't build a voting system overnight. It takes years. Colorado um, is probably, in, in my opinion, one of the ones of the best. Why? I mean, it was easy in Oregon and, and Washington because you had a largely upper middle class college educated population. Colorado looks more like America and they were able to perfect this over time. So every time somebody signed a ballot um, or signed in to vote, they would update that with an optical scan. So they were always getting, you know, my signature at eight, at 71 is very different than my signature when I was 21. Um, but the, these are issues 
I must say, and I'll say it on a personal level, I was not a big fan of expanding mail-in voting. And my reasoning was you, you just, you can, you can be, you can run into more trouble. And I believe that the biggest trouble here is the president and the Republicans who have knee jerked an attack on mail-in voting and what they have done, I think, and we'll know after the election is they've done themselves as well as I think the integrity of the election system, a great harm. Um, it's not obvious to me when I talk to Republican campaign managers that they are on, they are happy with the president's attack on mail-in voting. They're getting really worried that their voters who have voted by mail before will wait, if not to early voting, to election day. And that is dangerous. Nobody wants to harvest their vote on election day. If you have 10,000 voters you have to turn out in eight hours, that's hard. If you can do it over 16 days, much easier. And also checking on signatures um, and, and essentially going after people um, and, and voiding their ballots can go both ways. I mean, in Harris County, um, my sense is that you'll see probably more Democratic voters voting by mail, but there will be many Republicans who could have the same problem. Um, and there you're dealing with over 65 year old voters. You know, ADL is, a, is nonpartisan and our approach to, to voting rights is to ensure that everybody has the unfettered access to the ballot box and can vote, you know, without threat to their health as well as their, their personal security. One of the things that also puzzles me is I have not seen any, any research that shows that mail-in voting benefits one party over to the other. And I'm wondering if, if you no, no, have there, either. There, I, 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 my, I have a paper forthcoming. I have three or four colleagues. We've looked at this since the beginning of mail-in voting more recently. Not only does it not have a partisan effect, but mail-in voting does three things that I would have thought Republicans would love. It dramatically reduces the cost of conducting elections by a third in Colorado. Two, think about it. Ballot completion. Now, this may not be something Republicans in Texas are excited about, but voters who vote by mail complete 97% of the ballot. It's a take home exam with cheating. You get the ballot, you don't know who the judges are, but you have days, weeks to find out, talk to your spouse, talk to your friend, go online, look at the name of the candidate. Average in Harris County in 2016 and 2018, because I actually studied this, was that an in-person early and election day voter spent three and a half minutes completing their ballot and completed no more than about 65 to 70% of the ballot. They rolled off as they got through the screens. Finally, it increases turnout without advantaging either party. There has been no, let me make it very clear, and I've read several papers in the last year and a half, absolutely no evidence that there is a partisan advantage. There used to be a partisan advantage. No excuse mail-in voting was first widely adopted in California in 1974 uh, on a temporary and by on permanent basis in 78. And it had a dramatic effect on increasing Republican uh, voter turnout among people over the age of 65, when the parties use it. Since, since the turn of the century, nobody has been able to detect any partisan advantages. It does increase turnout. And I can explain, you'd say, well, wait a minute, doesn't the Democrats always have problems with turnout? So how can vote by mail increase turnout and not advantage the Democrats? The simple explanation is, it does increase turnout among some Republicans, mostly people who had already voted. It, it provides a convenience, but for um, infrequent voters, voters who are largely Democratic in this category, it's a notification. If you get a ballot in the mail and you didn't expect to get one, it kind of nudges you to vote. It's sort of like the publisher sweepstakes, right? You didn't <laughs> think you could win a million dollars, but why not try at least uh, well, get a magazine here or the, there? No, actually, I think it's easier to fill out a ballot than figure out how to turn in the sweepstakes, so. Um, I, there's a question here, and I think it's a very good one. People should understand how signatures are verified. There are poll judges who literally sit, one Democrat, one do Republican, sometimes as many as two or three, and they look at the signatures on the mail ballots. And they agree or disagree. They disagree, it goes to another group. And at some point, the clerk and the board rules that the ballot and the signatures don't match. And the questioner who asks this is, so how do you take into account the fact that Mark or Bob has been writing their signatures for 40 years and has changed? And the short answer is you don't. In Colorado, they have worked out um, a way to not only optically scan and match, and they use this in Utah too, I should say, Utah, Colorado, and um, but not in Oregon and Washington. They've not had that problem. 
but it's, and what they do is they pre-process the ballots. So for instance, you all saw that 94,000 ballots, mail ballots have been received. I am relatively confident that the clerk has gone through and verified signatures on those ballots. I can't be positive of that, but you know, it, it takes a little longer, but they're not waiting to election morning to do that. In Pennsylvania, they will, excuse me, in Wisconsin, they will. They'll have to wait till eight o'clock in Pennsylvania. Well, you can begin to see the problem there. Not only will there be many more um, uh, contested ballots, something else that's worth noting. There is a, I wouldn't say rumor, but there is a view, particularly in Wisconsin, where elections are not run by the counties, 74 counties in Wisconsin. They're run by 1,700 townships and municipalities. And there is some feeling that in Wisconsin, no ballot, no reporting of votes should be made until all ballots have been counted. Wisconsin now is under a six day additional counting of mail ballots and they may not release any results in person early, election day or mail until all are counted. My personal view is that's how you maintain the integrity of the election. If there's gonna be fights over mail ballots, you have those fights but you don't release partial ballots so that somebody thinks they won and then finds out with the mail ballots. Those mail ballots are just as legitimate after they're validated for signatures. But again, I don't blame anyone, but trying to rush to address, address the COVID-19 with mail-in voting. I, had, I wrote an op-ed with two of my colleagues for the Washington Post. We strongly, strongly urged counties to look at other ways and our county Harris. I think is a paragon of, of doing it right. They've gone to 112 early voting locations over three weeks. That's over a hundred hours of locations and times that people can find um, convenient, short lines, no viral load. They have PPE for the poll workers, um, all the masks, all the social distancing, small uh, rubber finger coverings as you touch. My suspicions are it will be a better if we had had more in-person early voting then pushed so much mail-in voting. Um, and look at those slides I sent, um, you're happy to use them, but you're seeing voters now who had gotten mail ballots surrendering their ballots at an early vote location, which they can do and voting in person because they're afraid that their mail ballots either won't be received by the post office, might take too long to drop them off at NRG, the only location in the state or that, um, their signatures for some unknown reason won't match up. When right, and s s speaking of uh, limiting the, the, the drop-off locations to a single location in the county, I, as you may know, uh, ADL, all the ADL offices in Texas, ourselves, Austin and Dallas are presently involved uh, in, in suing the Governor Abbott for the order which uh, mandated that each county should be limited to, to one drop-off. Uh, we did obtain an injunction on Thursday. Uh, it is currently stayed because of uh, once it was appealed, it was an automatic stay. Um, and we are seeking to, to address that and have an expedited uh, hearing on the appeal so that we can get that, that stay lifted. Um, and hopefully that will happen this week, uh, though ultimately probably end up in the, in the Supreme Court. Uh, number one, though, it, it has uh, you know, drawn attention uh, to this issue. Uh, and, and number two, hopefully we will be able to get the relief that, that we seek. Uh, but, you know, like you said, uh, you do believe that people have changed their decision in terms of voting by mail because of that order, number one. And number two, um, what, um, what do you think is driving, you know, these kinds of decisions that you know, I mean, let, let are coming that. down in order to, to make these changes so close to the election. Let me say two things, and I don't mean to be critical of ADL or any other group that fights to uh, extend voting opportunities, but the more legal battles, the more confusion that voters have. I can show you survey data that showed that 63% of people who intend to vote by mail could not accurately tell us in the survey how they could legally return their ballots. Why? Because it was a moving target. One day there were remote locations, another day there wasn't. This is, I think, a strategy, um, at least my experience is as sitting in and doing depositions and in these trials, 
it's very clear that the um, Trump campaign and Republicans in general are trying to, um, how can I say this, so confusion, um, particularly with things like mail-in voting where people are doing it for the first time. As I've said before, and finally somebody's reporting about this, I don't think that's a good strategy for Republicans. I might be very clear, the one consequence of these battles over mail-in voting, drop-off locations, early voting, signatures, is it drives down voter confidence that their vote will be counted as they intended it. And nothing is more dangerous to a democracy than when voters no longer believe that the outcome of the election has integrity. And um, that integrity has re reached an historically low point. I mean, to give you an idea how bad it is, um, after, before this phone call, I had um, spoken to the NSF director in, in, in my field, and it looks like we will be getting a big grant to study the post-election effects of mail-in voting on voter integrity. Um, that has become a major concern. And it's interesting that it's a bipartisan concern. You talk to Republican consultants, um, as in Republican, not Trump, and I'm convinced that this strategy of attacking vote by mail is a short-term goal, mostly because it's only had a backlash effect. Look at the number of people who are standing in long lines in Georgia, Florida. And my sense is that if the Republican vote comes out on election day, where I obviously, and, and later on early voting, that's where I expect it to be. But that's just a risky game. So if there's anyone in the audience who works, I mean, I, I know, I've talked to Republican consultants and all of them until yesterday would not have attacked the president. Now you're finding that Republicans are coming out and saying vote by mail is safe, vote by mail is okay, and we want our voters to do it. And I might note here, however much the Republican Party of Harris County might have been silent to the presidents, they continue to mail their voters applications for mail-in ballots, which I think, I think you have three more days to get a mail-in ballot, right, the 23rd. Can I ask you, um, following up on the confidence question, you've touched on it in a few ways, and our organization, the Religious Action Center nationally and in, in coalitions that the ADL is in too, are, have, have sort of revved up into not just election protection work, which we're already doing, but, but this major concern about um, protecting the confidence in the results of the election and wondering what, I wanna drill down on that that you raised already, what can, Jewish organizations do about that? What can synagogues do as far as, and can you talk about the, some of the data I've seen about um, there's this sort of window of confidence the number of days after the election at which the results come that voters sort of like maintain and then quickly lose confidence that the votes have been counted properly. Can you, can you talk about yeah, there's any, a lot any of aspect of that? that? If it takes three, four, five, and six days. And we, we know this from the, not just in the US, but in other countries. We saw it most recently in New York State where they went to vote by mail with no excuse. And it was weeks before some of the races, congressional primary races were known. Um, there's no question, voters lose confidence in the integrity of the outcome of the election the longer it takes to get results. Um, my personal view, if I had to make one recommendation, I would insist that no ballots and no results be reported until every ballot is counted, which means in those states where ballots are being returned, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania are the three big ones. It'll be true in New York, but I don't think it'll be consequential to the outcome. But in states where there will be a high proportion of vote cast by mail, and it will take, of course, multiple days after the election, no results should be reported. Um, I won't go into the legal ramification, you know, how could we make that happen? But I would, um, want the rhetoric to be every vote should be counted. And if there are mail ballots that have not been counted, nobody, including the president and no candidate on the ballot, should declare themselves a winner until every ballot is counted. Um, and in fact, in Texas, we don't really certify an election until almost a month afterwards when we do the full canvas. We announce preliminary results. Most voters don't know that. But I think the rhetoric has to be no elections call to every ballot is counted and treat mail ballots as if what, I mean, obviously the strategy of the president has been, I will declare myself a winner on election night if I am ahead in the popular vote on election day or in-person early voting. 
he will then claim that any vote that's handed in and counted after election day is fraudulent. And that plays to whether it's QAnon or people who believe that these are ballots that are not secured. Um, and I think there has never been any history of vote fraud um, by mail ballot being consequential in, in, in particularly presidential elections. And if there are provisions for that um, security, then they should be implemented, signatures being the obvious one. But the biggest one, don't let someone tell you they won the election on election night if there are still 50,000, 200,000, a quarter of a million mail-in ballots that the state did not allow to be counted until election night. So what uh, happened in Texas, by the way, nor in Florida. You know, do you have a, if you, you know, could guess, when do you think we'll have, be able to, quote, call the election for president? What is your best guess? I mean, I, I don't have a best guess. I, I can give you a range. If you can tell me where Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan are, both in terms of um, the uh, non-mail ballot vote. So for instance, if on election night, nobody listens to me, which they don't, um, and they announce the popular vote by mail in person early and on election day, um, Pennsylvania doesn't have in-person voting, uh, early voting, but they do have mail-in and uh, Wisconsin and Michigan do. Um, and the difference between Biden and Trump is greater than the total number of mail-in ballots, election over, which is normally the case. It won't be that. If the margin, if the president's margin isn't in those three states positive, that is, he's not winning with what votes have been cast in person. Think of it that way. You have in-person voting and mail-in voting, early election day. If he's not winning in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin by more than five points, then I think um, there'll be a debate over counting those mail ballots. I think he will go to the Supreme Court. If Biden's way ahead by double digits in those states, then it's gonna be interesting, and this is my prediction, it's not a call of the presidents. It may also be that Republican leaders in those states, because think about other candidates who are running for Congress, for Senate, state reps, all the way down. Are you going to hold up the count? If some Republican lost and thinks he could win with a mail-in vote, is he going to be happy that Trump's trying to get rid of ballots that were not only cast for him, but may have been cast for Biden? See, we were all assuming that it's at the top, but there are a whole bunch of candidates, 60 of them in our state, on a ballot who expect to get a result and are counting on mail-in ballots for them. So I'm not certain, I mean, at this point, the polling data would suggest that Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania of the three of the 13, what I call toss-up states are what I look for. I believe the president will win in Florida, but should he lose Florida, North Carolina, and Arizona, I don't think there's any conversation anymore. So it could be a long night, it could be a quick night. And the answer to the question, what are the chances on that? I would say that they range from around 0.2 for the president to as, as high as um, maybe 0.5. I think he has an even chance of keeping the, 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 the election long. He may do it over the opposition of a lot of Republicans. And remember this, he has to, the legal arguments, I'm sure uh, I, I saw Judge Edison here, he's got to go to the Supreme Court with a constitutional issue. States run our elections. I really don't think he'll bring out military. I don't think he'll attempt to, uh, how can I say, secure the voting boxes. But he's going to have to have a very good legal argument for shutting down the counting of mail-in ballots. And that remains to be seen um, in terms of the Supreme Court. I, I really wish those nine men and women the best, but I would not want to be. I mean, this will be the third election if Trump wins in this century that a ma majority of the popular vote did not go to the winning candidate. And it may be the second election in this century where the Supreme Court made the decision. That's never happened before except in 2000. And where will you be on election night? What, what are you doing? I work for uh, KHOU. Um, I have, uh, I'm their uh, resident, you know, whatever. 
And um, but I won't be at the station. I'll be sitting right here with my <laughs> American flag. My grandchildren bought me this. It's a flag of America, so I can figure out where the electoral vote is all night long. My grandkids are hopefully going to come over, and we're going to put little stars on it as uh, each candidate takes the thing. I'd like to switch gears a little bit uh, and look forward. I know you know this is a part one of a series. Part two will happen you know sometime in 2021 when you'll come back and help us understand you know what happened uh, you know from your research uh, post election. But but leading up to that, you know I know that you've been uh, highly engaged in working with the county to develop uh, a different system for Harris County to run elections. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that. Yeah, um, and some of you may know, um, Texas has an option for allowing um, elections to be conducted by a nonpartisan, non-elected election administrator appointed by a board that is made up of people from the county uh, government, uh, commissioners, um, clerk, tax assessor, and the county judge. Um, uh, the history of this, of course, uh, goes back to the Jim Crow and, and Reconstruction period, where we separated running an election from being a registered voter um, because of the poll tax. We had our tax assessor handling the voter registration list. We could go into that ugly history, but the important point is that um, the county adopted this. I did some research for the county at their request, at, at Rodney Ellis's specific request and the, and the county clerk and did a presentation on um, the effect of going from these, what we call separated to consolidated election administration and how they affect things like voter registration, voter turnout, um, issues of mail-in balloting. And I have to say, I was quite surprised. I rarely believe that making changes like this can have what I call uh, significant effects, but we began to see looking at other jurisdictions, not just in Texas, but throughout the whole country, over about a, I'm trying to remember a period of time that I was looking at, um, but a, a relatively long period of time. What was most interesting, and it speaks to the rabbi's earlier question, is that we found that voter confidence in um, election outcomes was demonstrably greater in jurisdictions that had shifted to these um, nonpartisan election administrators. Um, the or origins of that are not obvious to us, but um, they were there and they were, they were robust. So um, starting in uh, January, I believe, um, and I could be wrong here, um, they will begin a search for an election administrator um, and begin to do interviewing. And the next election we have in the 2021 year, which will be the spring elections, will be conducted by an administrator who will be responsible both for voter registration and the conduct of elections. Um, there is argument that this might have uh, economic benefits, streamlining, um, but uh, I've seen some, some data on that from Harris County, but that probably to most voters will be a little bit less obvious. Um, in the past, I know there's been a lot of criticism of the uh, tax assessor and for that matter of the clerk's office, most of which um, I think arose through uh, changes in, in the people running those operations. And they're very, very ambitious efforts to bring in new reforms, particularly uh, Diane Troutman, who brought in the election day vote centers. Um, and it, I had some growing pains is the best you could say for that. Worse was it was it was not the best managed transition. Can I can I ask about um, kind of segueing from there, jumping off from there to looking ahead to the legislative session at the statewide level? Um, granted, there's so much uncertainty about what that legislative session will even be able to be or do in person or not. Um, and I know you've spoken before about the balance of the Texas House potentially being in play, but um, we can come back to that too. My main question really is about um, a lot of our synagogues have been involved in voter engagement work. And I think that has increased people's appetite for voting reform because they've seen the system up close. And I'm curious about your thoughts on the most the most important voting rights or voting reform legislation that might make an appearance at the legislative session. Uh, I don't know that prospects are so high for things getting passed, but um, what do you think are the key pieces for Texas to to change in the next session or, or uh, beyond? You know, it's tricky. Um, everybody um, tends to um, game the election law to their partisan advantage, so. To answer that question, I have to answer another question. 
will the Democrats uh, get a majority in the House? Will they pick up enough seats to influence the selection of a new speaker? Will they be influential in the redistricting plans that will have to be done in 2021? Because this, of course, is the decennial year and when we do the census. Um, um, my sense is the Democrats are going to probably pick up seats they have in every election since 2010 in the House and in the Senate, but more likely in the House, the Texas House. Um, I think they might not get to nine, which is what they need. But when they get to six, seven, eight, or even nine, they can introduce legislation. Now, the interesting question, I've been asked this by a lot of people, what would be the most important change in election law? And that's a tough one. Um, I'd say there are maybe three or four things that I'd like to see done. I'd like to see a very serious effort to um, expand and improve on mail-in voting, which I think is clearly here to stay. Two, I'd like to see um, three weeks of in-person early voting remain. Four, I'd like to see efforts being made to make registration and application for mail-in ballots more accommodating online and what we call interoperability. That's just a very fancy computer word for it. If David moved from Austin to Houston, I didn't say from, I, David moved from, I think, Washington State at one point. I'd like to see it across the states, but within Texas, you shouldn't have to go through an arduous task of re-registering just because you moved from Austin to Houston or from Dallas to Lubbock, that you ought to be registered and merely update and not have to go through what amounts to be, you know, a series of obstacles. I think everyone will tell you that the Republicans have never favored online registration, which many states have, and Republican states along with Democratic. Um, but I think that's where those are the, the ones that I would like to look at. Yeah, I'd like to have a vote by mail of the Oregon, Colorado, Washington. I think that is enormous. And if anyone is concerned about security, I think, you know, look to those three states that have been doing it for probably the longest period of time, Oregon and Washington and Colorado. And they are really, they have really done a superb job on both voter fraud, voter um, uh, ballot in, uh, interceptions, um, and they now lead the country. I think Colorado has the highest turnout rate in the country, at, at close to 80%, um, which is phenomenal given that their average age of their voter is much younger um, than, you know, in Oregon and Washington, I, I think the world of them, but yeah, you know, it's easy to get a turnout there. But Colorado becomes, I think, the, the example and I never understood why the president attacks them um, because they were once a very red state, now probably much more blue. But those three things, registration particularly, why, why do you make people have to re-register? They do it through motor voter, but why make it difficult? And the answer is the Republicans seem to think this advantages them. I don't think so. I think they're wrong. Now that we've uh, driven you off the course of your slides uh, with our particular questions, uh, there's a request for us to resume the presentation. So let's jump back into Well, there that. wasn't that much more. Let me get it up, up again. I, I, I kind of wanted to talk about what could happen on election night. Um, I'm sorry, I got too many things up on my screen and I closed it. We, we wanted to create kind of a cliffhanger kind of situation. Yeah, I know you're, you're all- uh, It's all about the drama. The drama. Um, I thought the one that might be, um, and these are, you know, I, I think the, the question, what could happen? Uh, the three states, as I said before, I would watch on election night would be Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. I'd watch for Florida because although my inclination is to believe the president will win Florida, should he not win Florida, I think um, it's a very early night, not only because you need Florida, um, as a pathway to winning the electoral vote, but also because if you can't win Florida, places like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and, um, and Wisconsin, that doesn't portend well. Um, I do expect the, the, there'll be a big debate in the campaign. And I think what we don't really appreciate um, is how much the president and the people who are running his campaign may not be on the same page. And on election night, that'll be a tough one. Will the president insist that somebody like Mr. Barr well, he can't as attorney general sue on behalf of the Trump campaign. Um, and uh, going to the Supreme Court really puts the Supreme Court and Ms. Barrett in a terrible position. 
I mean, our institutions have been racked, the courts, the legislature and the presidency, but this is not one that I would want to be in this Barrett seat. Um, I do worry about a high share of mail ballots being disqualified. And from what I understand, there are groups from the NAACP to ADL to many um, unions to just uh, League of Women Voter types who are working diligently to tell voters, particularly in these states that have recently adopted no excuse mail-in voting, don't make these common mistakes. I know Pennsylvania is, um, particularly in the eastern part, um, in the big urban areas, making a big push. Um, worst comes to worst, the Supreme Court could decide this next election. They could, um, at the request of the Trump campaign, ask to bar ballots returned after a certain day or returned in a certain way in which equal protection for voters who mail their ballots in as opposed to voters who walk their ballots into drop-off locations became an issue. I just don't see how the Supreme Court, and I'm not a, a lawyer here, politically, I mean, you get nine men and women in a room and with the Chief Justice, um, it's hard to believe that men and women under the age, I think, I, th I guess the Chief Justice is 60, but I think Kavanaugh and Gorsuch and Barrett are clearly well under 50. I could be wrong on that, but they've got 30, 40, maybe more years on the court. We wish them well and good health. Do you wanna be remembered in history as now having delivered the second election to a president of your own party? That is who nominated you. I just think that's something you can go through all the law and at the end of the day, nine people have to look at each other. I'm not certain that Thomas and Alito have too much concern about that. I think they're well into their you know, 70s, they're my age, but um, they, they've been waiting for this moment. I, I offer Justice Souter's um, memoirs, or, or I guess it was his memoir, he left the court. Um, I remember reading that years ago um, and stunned at his criticism of the court for getting involved in the politics. Um, the other issue here is these late voting Republicans. I use the word late voting. I mean that by, there are a lot of Republicans who would normally have voted by mail. There are many Republicans who would have voted early in person. And for reasons I can only ascribe to the president and a sense that COVID is not in their minds a serious danger, they're gonna be voting on election day. And they may have the shortest lines. The great irony here is if you're really looking for a good turnout and you're not worried about COVID and you're looking for just, I don't wanna stay in long, you don't really care, you don't mind, and you can vote anywhere in Harris County, by the way. Other jurisdictions, you have to vote sometimes at a residentially local precinct. You might vote on election day. But my worry is two days after the end of the hurricane season, we still have a forecast for rain the first week in November. And um, wildfires, Colorado got terrible, the worst wildfire they've ever had. Now, does it affect turnout? No, they've been voting for almost, uh, I think, two weeks in Colorado. That is the end of my slides. Um, I'd be happy to entertain any more questions. Um, yeah, we, we do have uh, some questions from, from the chat room. Uh, one, a very kind of large looming question and, and the other, a couple of very specific questions to Harris County. But uh, the large question, which a lot of people have asked because you, you, know, you raised the specter of a possible you know, third time this century where a president would win the popular vote, but you know, lose the electoral college. What do you think if that were to happen, the prospects of at some point eliminating the Electoral College? I, I, not in my lifetime. I mean, whether I favor that or not, it's not the issue. But it, from, a, from a practical point of view, we're not getting rid of the Electoral College. I do think it is another element that undermines confidence in the outcome and the operation of government when we've only had, uh, if this election, well, if this election surely will be a popular vote victory for the Democratic candidate, uh, Joe Biden. The only real question is whether the president wins. It'll be the fifth election. The first two happened at the nascent days of our republic. And um, to have three in the same century, if you use the 2000 election, brings into question the stability of the party system of the United States. I personally believe that we should be going to a proportional vote system. I believe we should be looking at things like rank order voting. Um, you simply cannot govern a country where in the majority and now increasingly a large majority of voters 
are governed by a robust but faction. Um, the Federalist Papers pointed this out. Madison, in particular, pointed out factions can override the majority, and you cannot continue to govern when the uh, particularly um, in a decennial year, if you start electing minority legislators, minority as in they don't get the popular vote, but they win their state, they get to redraw the district boundaries, not just for the US Congress, but for state legislatures, city councils and commissioners court. You can't expect a society to govern with compliance with laws when majority rule does not prevail. We can talk about the history of the Electoral College, its origins, the, the three-fifths rule, the concern of the South against uh, the agrarian South against the industrial North, but the biggest concern was, of course, the prevailing issue of slavery, and it raises its ugly head almost 300 years later. But um, if an electoral outcome is of the sort that we had in 16 and in 2000 occurs again, I think you are going to have a difficult time, and I think um, there may be even efforts, particularly, I can imagine the president winning the presidency and losing the Senate. The House is a foregone conclusion. It will remain in Democratic hands. What the margin is remains to be seen. Then you could start seeing some extreme efforts on court packing. Um, and, and the paralysis that could result from that with COVID-19 continuing really brings bad thoughts. I mean, Obviously, my partisan preferences aside, I hope we have a clean election. What do I mean by a clean election? The guy that gets the most votes gets the most electoral votes. That outcome, I don't think is absolutely, well, it's not clear to me at this point. And, and, but no one's getting rid of the electoral college because the party in power, in this case, a president would never. And I might note here, that doesn't take, that's not an act of Congress. You can pack the courts without a constitutional amendment. But you can't get rid of the Electoral College. That's a constitutional amendment. Um, and the, the other two questions are more you know, particular to Harris County. One is, you know, drive-through voting um, is new. Uh, I actually did my, I drove through voting uh, and uh, it was fun and interesting and didn't take any time. Uh, there was not much of a line. Uh, what are your thoughts on on whether this is something that will you know, be, is this something only for now or do you think it'll stay with us for a while? Um, and, and the other issue is just more logistical, which is uh, what, ha what happens if somebody is concerned that their um, mail-in ballot that they drop off at, at NRG, you know, for example, might have an issue um, or they yeah. get a call, how do they remedy it? You know, what is the what do they do? What's the process? At this point, uh, let me say the, the first one. Once you give voters a taste of convenience, you never go back. Mail-in voting, drive-through voting, 24-hour voting. Um, these are reforms that are haven't been picked up because a lot of voters don't know about them. Um, but the most important one is that um, you're not getting rid of them. They'll, they'll, what, what we see is as you build a reform in, more and more people use it and like it. As part of a state mandate, um, my team at Rice, my colleagues and I are gonna be doing extensive analysis of all of these new election reforms. I am relatively confident that um, if you walk your ballot, or I guess you have to drive, I mean, you can rarely bike, but if you bring your ballot to NRG, um, if you haven't done that already, um, what will happen is you have to show me a driver's license and you have to sign a form and they match your signature right then and there. Because you have, to, you cannot bring in ballots for anybody else. And you have to sign and show that you're Mark Tobin and you have to show your driver's license. So if you brought your ballot into NRG and you there is a long line, that can be a problem. Then you can put it in the mail. Then it can be subject to verification for signature. They will not open your mail ballot at NRG to determine whether or not you signed the envelope or whether or not you put it in the security envelope. So there's still that step. But um, if you can get, my wife and I drove with NRG and we didn't wait. We just drove right up. I think we spent more time getting there from the heights than we did checking it in. But if you have some doubts, my personal view, I'm 70, almost 71. 
I think in-person early voting is safe. And if you cannot find over what is now remaining, I think, help me here, 12 or 13 more days at 112 locations over eight hours a day, except on the weekends, um, a place where it's convenient, where the viral load isn't high, and there's plenty of protective, um, what I call equipment for you and the poll workers, I, I think the, the likelihood of it affecting you in terms of COVID is low. Of course, I'm not a doctor, and but I think mail-in voting is relatively secure in the county. Paul Colbert raised a very good point, and I, and I mentioned this because the rabbi asked about voter ID laws. Um, you're not going to like me telling you this, but I've looked at this, many of my colleagues have. We have one of the most restrictive voter ID laws in the country, a photographic ID that is limited to four types and not including a student ID or my faculty ID, driver's license, a gun license, uh, a military and passport and a state ID, that makes five. Voter ID laws have never had a suppressive effect on voter turnout. I know my colleagues and I have looked for it in every corner. I have seen some of the finest research done, but it, it, is a, it has not deterred voters from voting. We have not been able to find it since, and I've been looking at these studies going back to the early part of the century. Now, there are many things that keep voters from voting, not the least of which is voters. <laughs> they're the biggest obstacle. They don't care, they're not interested, but I would not get into a battle over photographic IDs. Um, I think it's, it's, along with straight ticket voting, I think it's another mistake that the Democrat Republicans have, have foisted on us. And if you ask me why they adopted it, I think it has to do with primary voters. Republican voters believe there's voter fraud. They want their candidates to do something about it. And in states which have adopted strict voter ID laws, what we see is that the Republican primary voters have made that an issue in the campaign based on their belief that there is fraud. Not that anybody's ever detected it, and voter ID is least capable of um, having any effect on that. And, and is, is voter fraud, is that something you've actually looked into as well? Yeah, I can, again, in, the, in my work for the state of Pennsylvania, I did an extensive amount of work for them. Um, the, the lower the turnout race, the greater the chance that fraud will make a difference. Whether it occurs or not seems to be negligible, but we don't really have a very good way to measure that. And that's one of the things that two of my colleagues um, and I are going to be looking at in the post-election. It looks like we're, we're, we're like 75% through the review process. Um, on well, that. We, we look forward to yeah, those results. But voter ID, Paul, I, you know, I don't like it either, but if you're going to fight your battles, make voting more accessible by dealing with voter registration. What I found was that in states that required restrictive voter ID laws, where voters had registered under the new strict voter ID law. So what I looked at were states like Texas, Oklahoma, we could go on. And in those states, over time, I didn't look at counties or precincts. I looked at millions, tens of millions of voters who had changed or had registered for the first time under the strict requirement. Believe it or not, in some states, you can register without an ID, but you can't vote with that one. Wisconsin's crazy, but that's not the point. It's in those states which required restrictive voter ID laws that would voters who had registered under that were significantly more likely to vote because of the restrictive vote, a voter ID law. So what I'm saying is, it's not about the voting. They were looking at all the wrong places. Strict voter ID laws matters for registration. But when you register under a strict voter ID law, guess what? You're notified you won't be able to vote without that ID. And we found dramatic increases in voter turnout, and particularly in Black voters, Hispanic voters, younger voters. And what state? Florida. Two years after Governor Scott signed legislation for strict voter ID, limiting um, in-person early voting, sometimes known as souls to the polls, the governor reversed himself on some of those laws because they actually had the wrong, the opposite effect that they had been intended by the Republicans. There's nothing like, you know, believing in what I guess you'd call it fake news, fake science. If you do the research, voter ID laws, not where you want to do your battles. That's my advice. 
Bob, have you looked at the impact of that on you know, things like college towns and so on? We're not being able to use student IDs and the, and therefore the uh, driver's license doesn't match the voter registration address. Have you looked at that for Prairie View and places like that? Well, yeah. <laughs> I think I can say this. I was the expert witness in the NAACP suit against Waller. And mm -hmm. I looked at that deep and deep. And what did I find? If you lived on that campus, the only way you were going to vote in any election was in person early. Nobody voted. And the voter ID was not the problem. So, and in fact, my counterpart, who was the expert for the Waller County, a guy named Jim Gimbel, who's a fine political scientist, um, actually tried to, he replicated my work at other historical black colleges, like TSU, of course, where it doesn't have as much of a residential population on campus. But no. We've looked at this. I, Paul, I'll send you everything. But I, you know, one of my colleagues, Bob Erickson at Columbia, said to me one day, and he wrote it in the paper. He said, "We looked for this. We wanted to find this, and he couldn't find it." Um, uh, Erickson and Minetti. And again, I think I've actually talked to Paul Bettencourt about this. I mean, we're—I wouldn't say good friends, but I respect him. He's a good guy. He's not a bad human being, and he just have. But I once said, "What makes you think that straight ticket voting is going to help Republicans?" And he said, well, the way to put it is the gov uh, lieutenant governor's son got defeated for his reelection to, I think it was state court, right, Paul? I think yeah, it was state court. State judge. And I said, you're telling me that the anger of a father led us to getting rid of straight ticket voting. And he did not say yes or no to that. I want to be very clear. He just looked at me and said, have a good bike ride, Bob. But yes. I think sometimes life is simple. People do things for reasons that are not complicated, not sophisticated, but wrong. And I think yeah. when you look at straight ticket voting in the state since 2010, it's the Republicans that have been splitting their tickets. So if you want to get rid of the causation here isn't a button on a machine. It's a motivation of the voter. Mm -hmm. And so the question that the Republicans are asking is, can we reduce that motivation of Democrats to vote straight ticket by getting rid of the button? And then came along COVID-19 and mail-in voting. And what you, can you, there's no button on a mail-in ballot. You have to go through all of them, but you have plenty of time. So again, it's an empirical question, which we'll look at as soon as the election's over. But my hypothesis, I think with the increase in mail-in voting, I don't think you'll see down ballot candidates, state reps, county commissioners on the democratic side, losing that at straight ticket. I think what makes straight ticket voting hard without a button is if you vote in person. And if Republicans are voting in person more than Democrats, that's the working hypothesis I'm working under. Hi, Paul. Give my best to the family. So I think we want to start moving toward wrapping up. If there are some lingering questions, please put them in the chat. And um, I want to share, um, I think, by way of sort of action opportunities. And we'll hear from Mark again on the ADL side as well. And uh, well, one thing I'm just struck by is the, the disconnect sometimes between best intentions and actual outcomes, um, not just unintended consequences, but sometimes when our choices lead to the opposite consequences that we thought we would um, get. So the importance of having the expertise of someone like Professor Stein and people who study these trends and the psychology behind them, it's really valuable for those of us in the advo advocacy community to keep our feet firmly planted on the solid ground of consequences and what, what really, what are, the, what are the real reactions that we're going to get to the policies that we think we want to advocate for. Um, I will say that um, one of the things we're working on within the RAC Texas network, and uh, many I see many of our congregational leaders who joined us for this, which I'm very excited about, and again, grateful for the partnership with ADL, which I'm sure will be ongoing, especially on voting rights. Um, we are starting to think about next leg legislative session, but even before that, the RAC nationally has an effort to get involved in um, shoring up voter confidence in this election, really just to highlight what Professor Stein said about protecting the integrity of the election, whatever the outcome that, that people believe still in our institutions and in the process of democracy. And um, one of the things I'm sharing a link in the chat now, which is this um, election protection toolkit that we've put together out of the RAC National Office in DC. So please feel free to take a look at that. There's lots of different ways to get involved and bring into your community, into your congregation, into your organization. Um, please feel free to reach out to me with questions about that. And um, 
and I shared earlier, there's an action alert and I'll, I think I'll share it again because I don't think it came through as a link, but there is um, an action alert. You can just go to a website and fill out a form and it will send one of these form letters to the governor and the secretary of state, basically demanding what Professor Stein suggested in so many words around making sure to count every vote before results are, are called and before or, or before they're certified. So I'll go find that link again and put it in the chat again. Um, and um, for those who want to get more involved with us, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email in there too. And, and also reach out to your reform congregation. That's just sort of the center of our base. That's what our base is. And uh, many of you are already involved that way. So can push that forward too. Hand it over uh, to Mark. Yeah, th thank you, David. And, and first of all, so I understand that I had my mic uh, kind of lifted up. And so everybody missed my extraordinarily eloquent uh, opening. Um, and but I won't go through it again. Uh, but we will be sending the information out uh, via email that I that I talked about in terms of the programs uh, that are tomorrow as well as uh, never is now in, in November. Uh, I want to thank David uh, and the RAC for partnering with us on this really important topic. And we do look forward to to additional opportunities. And I also really want to thank uh, Dr. Stein for for his time and also for all the work that that he has been putting into um, helping us understand um, voting and how we can improve this process because it is the essence of democracy. Uh, and at ADL, that is what we are focused on um, from a nonpartisan perspective is how can we ensure um, that everybody has the opportunity to exercise their constitutional right to vote uh, in a safe and effective manner. Uh, and we welcome y'all's uh, support and help in that effort. Uh, we'll be sending out uh, information on, on how you can do that. So thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, and I hope everybody has a great week. Uh, thanks uh, to Margie Levin for uh, producing this program. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank you all. And thanks again to Dr. Stein. So thanks for being here. Take care. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you. you.